speaker this morning is my colleague in computer science at Harvard, Elaine Chen. Thanks for having me here. Um, so, so I want to talk about something about like mathematical modeling, um, the two set that computer scientists and many other quantitative like field researchers in the quantitative field tends to use and the intricacies related to thinking about uh, how to do a mathematical model. Um, so I will use labor market as an example. And this is based on joint work with Lily Hu, I think. Um, well, she, she's here now. Um, so I want to start by talking about uh, a very simple model that's try to explain discrimination in labor market. So this model arises from uh, the economics literature uh, where people try to explain uh, why there's persistent like discrepancy, uh, discrepancy between like minority group and majority group people in terms of wage and the like the percentage that are hired by companies on uh, skilled jobs. So uh, bear with me, this is going to be a very simple model. And at the end, um, so all models has abstractions, uh, but the hope is that the abstraction leaves something important related to the problem in the model such that we can make inference about the problem and say something. So let me just start by thinking that there are two subpopulations. So the blue people and the red people. Uh, they're bound to have roughly equal abilities. Uh, and I'm very vague about what I mean by ability because I want to make a distinction for the next step. So there are, essentially you can think about that they're population-wise or bound equal in terms of the, how they can learn, how much effort they're willing to exert and all those sort of things. And then the individuals of the population, they choose to invest in human capital. So those other things about how oh, they choose to get education, they learn new skills, and then some of them become qualified for some skilled job. So I use the, the shaded circles to represent those individuals that become qualified as a result of this investment in the hu human capital. And I'm trying to differentiate between the ability and the qualification of the individuals uh, and knowingly know that this is impossible to really tell them apart in practice, so this is the abstraction. Okay? Um, but what is known by a firm who's offering jobs that requires some skills uh, is that they, don't, they do not know the individual qualification. So for each individual, they don't know whether the individual is qualified or not. But what they do observe is the rough percentage of the people in a subpopulation that's qualified or not. So, so for example, the blue population are qualified uh, with 80% of people, and the red population is qualified only with 20% of the people. And you can think about this comes from historical data or just the beliefs of the firms. Okay. Uh, and then what's going to happen is that, uh, so a qualified individual uh, can exert some effort and have an observable signal and that's going to be correlated with whether he's qualified or not. So because I said that whether an individual is qualified or not, that's not observable by the firm, but this signal, which is correlated with the qualification of the individual, is observable. And we also know that, oh, so if an individual is qualified, then the probability for that individual to receive a good signal is going to be higher compared when if the individual is not qualified, then that probability of receiving a good signal is going to be lower. So, so now I have the two populations of the people. Fundamentally, some individuals are qualified, but that's not observable. Uh, but then they have some observable signals that's good or bad, for example, here. And then it comes to the hiring decision of the firm. So a firm cannot really observe whether an individual is qualified or not, but the firm can observe the signal. So if an individual come from the blue population and receiving a good signal, so the firm can observe the group identity and the signal that this individual has. 
And then if the firm is just a, a rational agent doing Bayesian reasoning, he's going to calculate the probability that given a blue person that has received the good signal, what's the probability that this blue person is actually qualified for the skilled job? And similarly, given a red person that has received the good signal, what's the probability that this red person is qualified for the job? And the way that I set up this simple model, because there is initial distribution differences, and it's more likely for a qualified person to receive a good signal, and by Bayesian rule, we can just uh, conclude that, oh, if it's a blue person who has a good signal, then the probability that this person is qualified is going to be higher for, uh, compared with the red person who has exactly the same signal. Okay? So it just seems to be that it's a rational decision for the firm to draw and saying that, oh, I should hire the blue person with a good signal with higher probability than a red person with a, a good signal. Oh, I should set the wage for the blue person to be higher. So I can roughly think about that. I can set the wage equal to the expected pro uh, productivity of an individual that I decided to hire. Can you give a quick example of what the signal is? In, uh, so the signal, um, so the signal could be some performance on a prior job, for example. And the human capital acquisition could be an investment in learning some skills. So, so this is a, an abstraction. I'm not trying to say that this captures everything about labor market, and that's the whole point. This is a simple abstraction. But this model looks very benign in the sense of there is no preference-based discrimination because the decision maker does not already have a preference over one group of people compared with the other group of people. And the decision maker seems to be very rational and just to trying to uh, inference based on who is more likely to be qualified. Um, what is the problem of this model? Um, you may say that, oh, this prior information is that wrong. So the bias comes into the model through here because the historical data may be biased and hence when this information is biased, all the inference can be wrong. But in fact, um, once we have a model like this, it is a self-fulfilling prophecy that the data being generated can be consistent with this model. So let me try to explain what does it mean. So if we look at a red individual who's qualified, um, the probability for him going to be hired is going to be lower compared with a blue individual who's qualified. <coughs> or in other words, the wage that this red individual is going to receive is going to be lower than the wage that a blue qualified individual is going to be received. And when an individual trying to make decisions on the human capital acquisition, the individual are going to do a cost-benefit analysis. So the cost-benefit analysis basically will say that, oh, the benefit for a blue individual is going to be higher than the benefit for a, a red individual to invest in human capital and become qualified. Okay? So already in favor of the blue group. And also, we can interpret this as a social reputation. And hence, the cost of acquiring uh, the investing in human capital can also be different for individuals from these two different groups. So usually it's less costly for a blue individual to invest in human capital than for a red individual to invest in human capital. So what it means is that there are going to be more blue people choose to invest in human capital and become qualified than the individuals that are red from the red group. So that basically saying that, oh, we have a feedback from the hiring decision back to the individual decision making, and this actually confirming the initial belief that there are more blue people that are qualified. So this could be very accurate to represent the data and what's actually happening in the reality. 
So this is a little bit puzzling. Um, it basically raises the question of how should I think about the boundary of my model? So if I want to do uh, analysis for, oh, what is the determina uh, discrimination in the labor market? Where should I draw the boundary of my model? So for example, I can draw the boundary of my model here, just to saying that this is the data, the historical data, and these are all the information that I have, and I'm making use of all the information that I have, try to make the best decision. So I am a rational decision maker. I don't have preference over a particular group. I'm just in an asymmetric information situation because I cannot perfectly observe the qualification of the individuals, so I'm trying to make my inference. And if I draw the boundary of my model here, so this actually seems to be pretty good because it is the case that there are more blue people that are qualified than red people. And I capture that. And my decision also capture that. So it, in some sense, satisfy maybe a notion of group fairness that computer scientists tend to think about. Okay? But this is also deeply troubling because for an equally good right individual, he's now being treated in the same way as a qualified blue individual. So at the individual level, this is not fair. And where I draw the boundary of the model also relates to like, how we ask the fairness-related questions. So for example, if I think about what outcome we really hope to achieve in a labor market. Um, so in general speaking, people will say that it's equality of opportunity. But there are two views of equality of opportunity. Um, so one is the formal equality of opportunity, basically just saying that, oh, we should advertise the position to all people. And then people can compete for the position. And the better qualified candidate should be hired. So which, in some sense, my model does achieve that. So I'm opening the position to everyone and I'm hiring based on the qualification. But this is still deeply troubling because my two population of people started with roughly equal ability. Although I'm not trying to precisely define what do I mean by equal ability, but there is a difference between what they born to have versus what they can do after they have invested in um, human capital. So, so when they were born, the two populations are roughly equal, but we ended up with an asymmetric outcome. So the other notion of equality of opportunity is substantive equality of opportunity that basically means that, oh, if people roughly start with uh, the same ability and they're willing to exert the same level of effort and use that ability, then their prospect of success should roughly be equal. And if I take that view of what we want to achieve as the outcome of the labor market, uh, the previous model doesn't achieve that. And we should try to think about expanding the boundary of the model by including the feedback loop here. So we need to explicitly think about how individuals are going to make their decisions uh, with respect to a particular employment rule here. OK, so, so that's, uh, I think that's the first point I want to make. It's kind of tricky to really think about what is the boundary of a mathematical model and what to include in a model. And if you're willing to expand the model to considering the human decision making, the individual's decision making in the human capital acquisition, then we can do a different kind of analysis. Uh, so we can think about that the observed asymmetric outcomes are equilibrium result of a dynamic game. Um, and what we observed as discrepancy are essentially saying that the game reaches an equilibrium point and it's very dif difficult uh, for an individual to deviate from that equilibrium. So this is from a game theoretic perspective trying to think about the problem. But then the question is that, 
if we really want to achieve the substantive equality of opportunity, uh, what can we do? Other interventions that we can do uh, to drive the system toward a better outcome. So better means a really substantive equality of opportunity here. Okay. Uh, so if we consider the bigger model, we actually can think about the dynamics here and what we can do. Um, so we think about the, the normal labor market as a dynamic <coughs> game. So there are two groups of workers, and each worker is bound into one of the two groups. And then workers make investment decision about like, their human capital investment. And then they enter the labor market, and firm makes a hiring decision, and worker produces observable outcomes, and that observable outcomes contributes to a group reputation for that group. And the firms can make use of the group reputation and try to update the group reputation, and then we're back to the next generation of the workers. So that's one way of thinking about the, uh, just a one stage labor market in a dynamic setting. Okay? Um, what we can do is we can have a dual labor market set up. So by introducing a temporary labor market. So after worker makes their human capital investment decisions, they enter a temporary labor market where firm makes hiring decisions, and we can have some intervention here. Okay? And then workers exert effort on the job in temporary labor market that produces some outcomes. Then they enter a permanent labor market but now the firms can make hiring decisions solely based on uh, the observations of the produced outcome, and there is no restrictions. Um, and then workers exert effort on the job in the permanent labor markets produces outcomes that affects their group reputation, and this just to continue uh, indefinitely. So we can think about like uh, if we have a temporary labor market as an intervention, then whether it's possible for us to um, like essentially move the system out of the undesirable equilibrium and maybe leading toward a more stable outcome in the future. And if I have the intervention just saying that we require a statistical parity of hiring uh, in the temporary labor market, so which basically means that uh, the probability that an individual is hired is conditionally independent of her group membership. So essentially, we're forcing um, a population-wise parity here for the temporary labor market. And if we just to do that temporarily, then the statistical parity hiring in the temporary labor market, it ensures equitable representation with respect to the ability so the original ability of the two groups of populations, but not with respect to their qualifications. So even if one group have more people who are qualified, so this does not like, satisfy parity with respect to the qualifications. Um, so, and there's no restriction about how firms uh, choose to make their hiring decision in the permanent labor market. So they can do whatever that's optimal for them. So if we do this and think a model like this, then what we can show is that, oh, there exists a, a unique group symmetric steady state. So essentially, the individual reputations fitting into the group reputations, uh, and that pr produce externalities that affects the group's future generations' cost of investing in uh, human capital. And that essentially will lead to a state where two groups are being hired um, equally with respect to their uh, ability. But a caveat here is that um, this is the existence result. So we're not claiming that this will be reached soon, and we actually don't know how long this steady state will be reached. Okay. Um, and it's also under some conditions, this type of like intervention can produce a welfare that's better than a group blind hiring strategy here. Okay. Um, so that's basically what I want to talk about. Um, and I'm not trying to claim that the broader model is the right model. It's just a model trying to consider uh, a little bit more of the, the social intricacies in the labor market. 
and the labor market itself is situated in a bigger social system. So for people with a technical toolbox that likes to use mathematical modeling, I think a question that we now asking ourselves is that where should the boundary of abstraction be to be? Because when we want to do theory, we need abstraction for tractability, but we're also aware that oh, the abstraction also are ignoring a lot of important social aspects of the problem. Uh, so I think this is something that really need interdisciplinary effort to try to figure out uh, when algorithms or abstractions and mathematical models can be helpful in this domain. Thank you very much. So it was very interesting. I, I have a question. Wouldn't it be easier to subsidize the workers' investment decision? To it, it could be. There, there may be other. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I think that's probably what's done now. You know that there's they provide extra programs and training for people in groups that are are discriminated against. Right, right. So I think the, the other caveat is that we're really now comparing different ways of like different alternatives of intervention and try to say that this right. is the better way. Right, but very interesting but, to think about. Yeah, I think it's Thank a very interesting to think about. And uh, uh, it's also like there is technical limitations with this type of analysis about how tractable we can get. So all of that's what limiting. Right. <laughs> Um, I don't know. But I mean, look, 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 look. Four questions. If you want to write some down, next. Anybody oh, else? Oh, you want to write them down and then you submit them? Is that how that goes? No. That's no. what we've been doing for the most part. Okay. I have to mirror it or move it around. Wait, this is If you want, you can move it into the... I'm just trying, it's not my thing, but here, how about this? Okay. Do it. Okay. There we go. So the, the next speaker was one of the co-conspirators in the early works on, the, on fairness, Mara's Hart, now a professor of computer science here at Berkeley. Thank you, Cynthia. It's really been a terrific workshop. I want to thank all the organizers for the um, opportunity to participate. I've been learning a lot. And I want to tell you a little bit or talk to you about um, how we can uh, talk about human categories and human kinds and causal analysis and causal modeling. And I'm still a bit of a dilettante in this topic. And this isn't sort of complete work, and I don't have the answers, really. I mostly want to start a dialogue with you and, and, and sort of have the opportunity to learn from you about some of these topics. Um, and so, you know, uh, this was basically the fairness community in 2016. Um, so there were a lot of uh, issues in the fairness community, and uh, people were like, you know, it seems like causality sure would be, uh, you know, a good fix for a lot of the problems that we're facing. And it seemed like sort of that was a match made in heaven uh, between, you know, the sort of questions of discrimination, decision making, and causality. And a lot of people started thinking about causality and fairness. I was one of them, um, and there were a bunch more that in 2016 had that sort of inclination. Uh, so and it's 2019 now, and uh, you know, uh, you know, it's uh, we don't really, um, you know, we kind of stared into the abyss, and it uh, stared back at us, and we don't have all the answers, um, and in particular, we haven't solved all the problems that we thought Cazelli might solve, and and I'm going to try to reflect a little bit on why I think uh, we haven't solved all the problems that we wanted to solve with causality, and the, I'm going to focus on a single question, even though there are more facets to it, but the question I'm going to focus on is. What do we actually mean when we put categories such as race or gender in a causal model and, and make causal claims about it? Um, and this is a question I've been exploring for some time now. Okay, and since this is Berkeley, I'm going to give you an example that, you know, torture you one, once more with it. You know, you've probably seen this many times before. I'm going to have a bit, bit of a different spin on it. Um, so UC Berkeley grad admissions from this famous paper by Bickel et al. from 1975. Sex bias in graduate admissions, data from Berkeley, measuring bias is harder than is usually assumed, and the evidence is sometimes contrary to expectations. That was the title. 
And the data uh, from Berkeley showed that um, there was a male acceptance rate of 44% in graduate admissions uh, and a female acceptance rate of 30% uh, uh, in, in graduate admissions, at least when you look at the top six departments. I like to look at the top six departments because they all have large numbers, so we don't have to worry about sample fluctuations and whatnot. Top by size? Top by size. Okay. size. Just like no, number of applicants. This is like a, a, a moment of imprecision. Um, all right. Uh, whew. Um, okay. Um, largest by size. Okay. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm not labeling them, so I don't derail this discussion, but basically. Um, what happened, so basically the, the story here was you might, from these uh, acceptance rates, you might be worried that there is discrimination against female applicants uh, because the acceptance rate is lower. And then you look at it at the department level and Bickel argued, well, departments have autonomy over who they admit. And so you should look at this at the department level. And there you see that for the largest department, actually the acceptance rate was 82% for women and 62% for men. And the second largest was 68% uh, for women and, and only 60% for men. Then there were in the third largest, there was a little bit of a, an advantage for men, 37 to 34, then it was 35 to 33, and 28 to 24, and 7 to 6. But you can see from this data, if you sort of disaggregate the data and you look at the department level, uh, you don't see a bias in favor of men generally uh, at the department level. So at the department level, it seems to have sort of the trend seems to have reversed. The acceptance rate is, uh, is uh, generally a bit higher for um, women. And so Bickel had, a, had a told sort of a, had an explanation for this, and their explanation was this. Okay, so they are, uh, they wrote the bias in the aggregated data stems not from any pattern of discrimination on the part of the admissions committees, which seems quite fair on the whole, but apparently from prior screening at earlier levels of the educational system. Women are shunted by their socialization and education toward fields of graduate study that are generally more crowded, less productive of completed degrees and less well-funded and that frequently offer poorer professional employment prospects. So basically his explanation was that women apply to more competitive departments and hence get rejected a lot more than men who apply to less competitive departments. And so he was sort of arguing that it's a bit of a pipeline problem. Whatever the interests are in department choice, women seem to have interests in more competitive departments. And so this was sort of the argument that stood at the time and was sort of convincing enough for uh, this case to sort of be considered resolved. Um, and it was picked up by Judea Pearl in his uh, 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 wonderful book from 2009, The Textbook Causality. Um, and he kind of endowed this Bickel explanation with a causal story, a causal explanation. And he said, the way you would model this uh, uh, from a causal perspective is that there are three variables, gender, um, department choice, and admissions outcome. And uh, he stipulated the, this uh, causal graph that gender uh, causally influences admission in some direct path, but there is an indirect path uh, by which it influences the admissions outcome that goes through department. Okay? So just as a note, since some of you uh, in, in, in causal speak, what this means is that department choice mediates the influence of gender on admissions. So department would be called a mediator. But since some of you haven't seen these uh, causal graphs, let me just give you sort of one slide on how you should read this. Uh, so causal diagrams are a network of interactions. They tell you who listens to whom, okay? So a causal error from X into Y means that the, the variable Y listens to X. So if you somehow, uh, you know, if X varies, uh, so does Y. And slightly, a little bit more, uh, or maybe more formally, um, a causal error is a placeholder for some mechanism by which, in this case, department choice is determined by gender up to exogenous variation. So what this means is you could write department choice as a function, just a deterministic function, of gender and some noise variable that's independent of gender and department that models exogenous factors. This is how you should, how you should read these, uh, these diagrams. Uh, and if you have more than two uh, incoming arrows, it just becomes a function of uh, the incoming variables, okay? So for instance, admission would be a function of department, gender, and some other noise variable that's independent of everything. So this is how you should read these causal graphs. They tell you how you can piece together the data or the, the, these variables and what is kind of the dependence structure among these variables. Um, so returning to this, what Pearl argued is that discrimination should really be considered this link, the direct link of, you know, that goes from gender to admissions. That's sort of like how admissions actually directly use gender 
And this uh, di indirect influence that goes through department choice should be considered OK because it expresses uh, sort of you know, preferences of the, that the applicant has that might depend on gender. And so as an aside, this is not the point I'm going to make, but this, this explanation always bothered me a great deal. Like it never seemed like at all satisfactory to me. For instance, you could be hiding a lot of weird stuff in this uh, indirect path that goes through uh, department choice. What if really that one edge is not one edge, but it's actually a factor like fear of a department, fear of being discriminated or isolated in a department uh, that shapes your department preference. Maybe you're like not applying to that department because you're worried that you'll be the only uh, woman in that department or that department has a bad track record of how it uh, treated women in the past. And so I'm not sure we should be quite that ready to like discount this indirect influence that goes to the department because it could really look like this or many other ways, okay? But this is just my sort of quick uh, way of saying that I'm not okay with normatively describing discrimination as a direct effect of the sensitive category onto the decision outcome. I think that's much too narrow a view. If anything, that could capture something like disparate treatment, but it cannot sort of address a broader perspective of, of discrimination. And so I'm not happy with this, but that's not the point uh, of this talk. That's a separate story that I'm happy to talk to you about. Uh, what is my point is, uh, you know, if we return to this original graph, how should we read? How should we interpret? How should we conceptualize uh, gender as a cause in this causal graph? Um, and so how do we find the direct effect of gender on admission? And I'm just going to give you some quotes from uh, Pearl's uh, excellent book, The Book of Why. If you haven't read this, it's quite, um, quite an excellent introduction to, um, to causality. I like it quite a bit. And he picked up this Berkeley admissions example again and discussed it in more detail. Um, and here is how he tells you you should get at the direct effect. We get the direct effect of x on y when we wiggle x, here gender, without allowing m, here department, to change. And then he says, we hold constant the variable department and then tweak the variable gender. I'm not sure I can even talk about tweaking and wiggling <laughs> gender variables in public. And I don't know which is worse, to tweak or to wiggle them. And so I'm going <laughs> to leave that behind at this point. But it shows you just how hard it is, even for somebody who's thought about this a lot, to articulate exactly what we mean by gender being a direct cause of something. Right? And so he uh, rephrases this a little bit a page later and says, we force everybody to apply to history and randomly assign some people to report their sex as male. So here we see sort of a different interpretation, which is it's not so much what your gender is, but what you report. And that's sort of uh, reaffirmed on the next page when he says uh, women that would be, or a woman would be admitted if she faked her sex to read as male, right? But sort of it's pretty clear that wiggling, tweaking, misreporting, and faking doesn't seem to be a robust basis for talking about, you know, sensitive categories and causal modeling, okay? And so... Um, that's why some people in the causal community said we can't do that stuff at all. We can't talk about gender or race as causes, okay? And maybe the first uh, our explicit our, uh, articulation of this viewpoint was Holland in 1986 who wrote, put as bluntly and contentiously as possible in this article, I take the position that causes are only the things that could in principle be treatments and experiments, okay? And the only way for an attribute to change its value is for the unit to change in some way and no longer be the same unit. Statements of causation that involve attributes as causes are always statements of association between the values of an attribute and a response variable across the units in the population. So for Holland, a statement like she was rejected because she was a woman uh, is just a statement like, um, sort of statistically speaking, women are more likely to get rejected in these kind of situations. So he says, these things are never causal. They're always like statements of association. Um, but sometimes it's sure nice to talk about race or gender as a cause. And so there is a proposed solution in the community that Issa calls the Ruben Greiner uh, solution. Um, and it goes like this. So instead of talking about race as a cause, you talk about exposure to race as a cause. For instance, the name of, of a, on a CV. And instead of talking about what happens to you because of your race, you talk about how decision makers respond to stimuli of race. Okay? Um, and so you will ask questions like, how does a car salesman respond to you know, perceptions of race in like, uh, when, they, when they sell cars or whatever? Or how do decision makers, hiring committees, um, respond to ethnic names on CVs and so on? 
Um, and then the hope is that exposure to race is something we can tweak and wiggle without this embarrassing uh, sort of interpretation. Okay, that we can say we can like randomize names on, on CVs, we can randomize something. Um, and, uh, but I, I find, you know, Isa Ola Hausman's cr uh, critique quite compelling from her, from her paper, and uh, she's going to talk more about this and why this is not a solution and why this is more of a trick that doesn't uh, sort of address the sociological difficulties here. Okay, so can we put race in a causal model? Is that, is that possible? Is that something we can do? And so when I thought about this question, I, I actually had to sort of step back, uh, take a step back and ask a more basic question, you know, what is a causal model? And what is a model anyway, right? So this is where we're going to ask the really deep, uh, you know, philosophical <laughs> questions in this talk, like, you know, is it maybe just albino bro broccoli and not cauliflower and, uh, you know, we'll see. So um, I'm going to connect to a point that Yiling alluded to and I'm going to try to make a little bit more explicit that models are systems of reduced complexity that separate a set of variables from their possibly chaotic broader surroundings in the universe. And actually, Pearl summarized this very cleverly and, and, and in a way that I found uh, tremendously insightful in his 2009 book. He wrote, if you wish to include the entire universe in the model, causality disappears because interventions disappear. The manipulator and the manipulated lose their distinction. However, scientists rarely consider the entirety of the universe as an object of investigation. In most cases, the scientist carves out a piece from the universe and proclaims that piece in, namely the focus of investigation. The rest of the universe is then considered out or background and is summarized by what we call boundary conditions. This choice of ins and outs creates asymmetry in the way we look at things, and it is this asymmetry that permits us to talk about the outside intervention and hence about causality and cause and effect directionality. So it's in fact the boundary box that we draw is what gives us a notion of causality. If you look at the universe at the atomic level and evolving according to the laws of physics, there may not be a clear notion of, of causality. But if you carve out a piece and you draw a bounding box around it, you can talk about interventions, and that's what gives you causality. And so the question that this leads to, and why I think this is such a, a good way of looking at it, is what bounding box can we draw around race? And you know, what is race ontologically and epistemically? So if we're going to put race in a node, we must sort of talk about why we can leave out certain things, why we can divorce you know, race from certain other things happening in the social system that gave rise to our notion of race. Okay, and so this thing is where things get really complicated because we're going to go into the ontology of race that is, uh, continues to be unstable. And so just to make the sort of drive home the point that causal claims implicitly reference ontology, let me give you a few examples, some of them uh, also from Issa's uh, uh, paper, actually. So how about this, uh, this statement, rain caused the grass to be wet, okay? Um, it's not like this uh, sort of like a perfectly clear statement, right? It's, uh, you know, I have some, I reference some implicit, you know, notion of grass and rain and what it means to be wet. And maybe I'm not exactly sure what botanical category uh, grass is. But for the statement that I'm trying to make, it doesn't really matter what kind of plant grass is, right? It doesn't really matter where it sits in the broader ontology of plants. It's just sort of a very robust statement that doesn't sort of hinge in delicate ways on the ontology of these, these things. Let me give you a few other examples. Throwing of the stone broke the window, right? You could imagine somebody like trying to like sort of hurl lava at a window or something like that, right? And uh, you know, like, but I assume that it's actually the rigidity of the stone here that broke the window relative to the rigidity of glass, right? And these sort of make references to our understanding of, of glass and, and stones and, and windows, right? Um, and so here's a, another one. Uh, how about witchcraft killed the man, okay? Who has a, knows a movie with like witchcraft in it where somebody dies from witchcraft? I think I've never watched, what? Witches of Eastwick. Witches of Eastwick, uh, anything else? Harry Potter. Okay, how about Harry Potter? <laughs> I've never watched Harry Potter, um, but let's suppose somebody, you know, was killed in Harry Potter with witchcraft, right? If I say, uh, we're watching this movie together, and I say, oh, witchcraft killed the man, then you find that a perfectly uh, acceptable statement because I'm making reference to some implicit ontology of what witchcraft is that applies to this movie. But I hope you're not going to go out of the room and say, oh, there's this Berkeley professor who thinks that witchcraft can kill people, right? Nor so. Right, right. Okay, let's, let's not, you know, get into that. But, uh, you know, 
Um, basically, there is, you know, the statement makes sense, uh, you know, when it references a certain kind of context in ontology, it doesn't make sense as a universal law of, like, death and witchcraft, right? Um, and then attention deficit, deficit disorder caused the student to perform worse on the test. There's another interesting example because that's a new category that was constructed fairly recently, right? And such a statement is not sort of universal and wouldn't have made sense at all times and maybe continues to evolve as we sort of update our understanding of this. And so then how does a statement like she was rejected because she's black fit into this? And how do we, uh, how do we think about these statements? Let me give you two examples that show you just a partial view of how different ontological constructions of race lead to different modeling choices, which then lead to different insights. Okay? And here is a first hypothetical ontology. It's basically the way it's typically drawn in a technical paper on, on race and discrimination. You would conceptualize race as a source note, something that you know, uh, doesn't have any incoming arrows. And what that means is sort of, you know, you say, well, race is a trait that's present at birth um, and that influences various things like education, health, income uh, throughout the life. And as you go through life as an individual of a certain race, things happen to you. You have different access to opportunity. You have a different educational outcome and so on. And so people draw it that way. And that's a typical way that people might go about it in technical papers. And so in this view, all these variables that edu education become mediators between race and the outcome. And the complexity, this bounder, bounding box stuff, enters the picture because I now need to think about what are all the relevant social factors that mediate between race and the outcome? What are all the things in the surrounding social system that I need to include to have a meaningful statement about how race influences the outcome? Okay? And what are all the pathways in which race can influence the outcome as you go through life? And so how can you like, get a clean model of that? That would be the challenge with this kind of view. But let me give you an alternative view, which is maybe like closer to sort of the social constructivist account of race. That race is a category that society assigns to you. It's not something that's a sort of a quasi-biological trait. It's something constructed that people uh, categorize you with. And the way you're categorized changes your behavior in response to the category. And how you change your behavior in response to the category depends on various social factors. For instance, a Harvard professor might express race differently than an artist or a car mechanic. Okay? So your level of education might influence how you express race. And so there's actually an incoming arrow from you know, social factors like education into race, which determine how you respond to this categorization and how you express it. Okay, and this is interesting because the arrow now goes the other way, okay? It's like not this sort of like uh, biologically uh, uh, sort of inspired trait idea that it sort of uh, comes as a source node, but it's a category that's placed on you, all right? And I think this perspective might actually be a little bit closer to uh, uh, what's called the social constructivist view of race. Okay, and the problem with this view is that you now have all these other variables that you could include, which could also confound, <coughs> this is called a confounder because it causally influences both uh, uh, this node and that node, um, you have to think about all the other possible confounders that you might have to include. Uh, uh, sort of have to pull out of the social system and include, of, include in your model to make sense of this kind of model. Okay? And so uh, the thing here is neither of these are meant as like definitive ontologies of race, and I'm not proposing that this is necessarily how we should model it. My point is, however, that in the first uh, ontology that I presented, uh, education was a mediator. Education became a mediator between race and the outcome. In the second one, education is a confounder. It's something that influences both the outcome and uh, the sensitive category. And so, again, to give you a pearl quote, as you surely know by now, mistaking a mediator for a confounder is one of the deadliest sins in causal inference and may lead to the most outrageous error. The letter invites adjustment, the former forbids it. So, uh, this has real sort of pragmatic and technical import. You, like mistaking the two things will lead to just invalid results. Okay, so it's not you know this is the point where we can't just pretend like this is all sort of int intellectualizing uh, the the subject and it's not relevant for sort of pragmatic data science. It totally is. Like you just simply get invalid results if you get this wrong. So if you model ontology uh, incorrectly or imprecisely, you uh, get wrong statements, wrong interventions, okay? And so this is a practical matter at all, uh, after all. 
And so why is this so completely complicated to model the ontology of race and, and include it in causal models? And I'm maybe out of time, actually, but um, great. But I have just one, one, one slide left, basically. Um, so basically, uh, you know, there are two sources of instability. This is from a recent book of Ron Mellon, um, uh, The Construction of Human Kinds. Taylor instability sort of refers to changing norms, epistemic activities, uh, and uh, theories about race. And then there's a one I, I, that quite resonates with me, which is hacking instability, that sort of there's a feedback loop between categories and individuals uh, that looks something like this. And the way you categorize people changes their behavior. And in response to how they change their behavior, your construction of the category becomes invalid. It needs to be updated. So according to hacking, categories are always moving targets. They're never completely stable. Um, and so just to sum up and give you some pragmatic routes forward, I've been stuck on this topic for a long time. And I don't want people to stop talking about sensitive categories in, in causal analysis. I think it makes sense and, uh, to think about how we can make causal statements about these things. And a lot would be lost if we could no longer say she was rejected because she was black. And we can't make sense out of these statements. And so let me give you a few pragmatic routes forward that I want to discuss with you. Um, there's an idea in Mellon's book called Stable Enough Ontology. So I want to think about how much, so how stable do these things have to be for us to make certain kind of statements? Okay, uh, can we somehow get a better understanding of what kind of stability we need to allow for certain causal claims? Um, then there, uh, philosopher Nancy Cartwright has an interesting notion called single case purpose built causal models, which are kind of um, getting into this idea that causal models do not encode universal quasi-physical laws about the universe. They're actually very narrowly scoped, and you need to think about what social facts are referenced implicitly in your model and how you build sort of context-sensitive models that might be good for one case, one scenario, but not all. Um, and then uh, Isa is probably going to talk more about considerative explanations uh, and how to imper interpret causal explanations as such. I think that's very interesting. Uh, Yiling, Yiling talked essentially about how you design interventions that might reduce inequality without talking about race as a cause or without talking about gender as a cause. So I think there's a broad range of uh, interventions that you can uh, talk about uh, and inequality, inequality reducing interventions that do not require us to talk about race as a cause. Okay, finally, uh, and I, I think uh, Jay is going to talk about this, there's a wealth of knowledge in the epidemiology community around health disparities and race and health disparities. And these folks have figured out a lot of uh, ways of being creative with modeling race and health disparities. And um, you should look into a lot of the papers from epidemiology. I think they're a step ahead on this, and it's good to learn from them. All right, thank you. I'll repeat uh, the question. All right. Yeah. No, no, no. Give her uh, mic. So um, it, it occurred to me in the two I I that, that, okay. that um, so, uh, one is just a broad, uh, I really like that you ended on learning from practices in epidemiology and other neighboring fields that have sort of gone through this process of trying to think about these things. And one of the places where I think epidemiology has ended up, thanks to Nancy Krieger and many others, is thinking seriously about studying racism and not race. And so the black woman wasn't discriminated because she was black, she was discriminated because of racism. And so really shifting the language, I think, can get at cl much closer to the, the actual cause. It's not an inherent quality of the individual, not even that they change their behavior. And so I wonder if you and others are, have, have examples of that where we're operationalizing racism. And it's interesting that the example of witchcraft, because there's a great book that I would recommend that people check out called Racecraft, in which um, Karen and Barbara Fields actually draw this parallel between um, the kind of way in which witchcraft as a causal world view can be understood as, an, as uh, shaping racecraft in the United States specifically. So if you want to sort of use that as a touchstone to thinking about it, I would really encourage it. Yeah, thank you so much for your comments uh, and the, the pointers. I want to return to that question in the panel because I think Isa and Jay are going to have a lot to say about the question of when can we put racism in a model as opposed to race and when does that work and what do we get from it? So I'd like to return to that question. Absolutely. Thank you. The next speaker will be Jay Kaufman in Epidemiology and Biostatistics at McGill University.
Uh, thanks very much. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll try to give the perspective from, bio, from medicine and, and epidemiology. Uh, we use algorithms all the time in epidemiology and medical practice, trying to decide, uh, trying to use evidence in order to find optimal treatment strategies, diagnostic strategies, um, to optimize some outcome, however we define it. So we have a whole technology for developing these algorithms, and of course there's some attention to the fact that they be fair, that they don't involve discrimination. Uh, we've discussed in this session over the last few days that we don't have good um, consensus on what it means for an algorithm to be fair, for there to be an absence of discrimination. We have a bunch of different uh, definitions that might be in conflict with one another. We might say that the algorithm shouldn't rely um, explicitly on a protected class, like um, I shouldn't uh, arrest people because of their race or because of their gender, um, or I shouldn't treat people in a certain way because of their race and, and gender, There's some kind of direct discrimination like that. Um, and then I could have another kind of criteria, which is that I want some equality of outcomes. Like I, I have to treat people in such a way so that uh, I don't have excess cases of disease in one group or another, or excess cases of incarceration in one group or another. Um, and uh, these can be in conflict with one another. Like we have to make some kind of a societal judgment about how we weigh these different kind of criteria. So in medicine, for example, um, we might, uh, it, it, it's considered normative or ethical to explicitly refer to these protective cla protected classes like um, uh, race or, or gender in treatment or screening in order to equalize outcomes. So for example, I have here the uh, prostate cancer screening guidelines from the American Cancer Society saying that uh, men should start prostate cancer screening at the age of 50, uh, but if you're in a high risk group, which includes uh, black men, then you have to start screening earlier at 45. The recommendation is to start screening earlier at 45. Um, and the goal there is to, uh, well, that if you screened everybody at age 50, that it would be unfair to black men because they would end up with more cases of advanced stage prostate cancer at, 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 um, at detection or they would have higher mortality from prostate cancer. So this kind of logic is that you have to make it unequal in the screening recommendation so that it can be equal in the outcome. Um, and uh, John's favorite example, John Kahn's favorite example, uh, uh, race-specific drugs like Bidil, same kind of argument. If you have a, a drug treatment strategy and it seems to disadvantage one group, then you should explicitly use this protected class in the uh, assignment of a drug treatment. Uh, or we have that uh, also normatively for um, dosages of drugs, like this ACE inhibitor and in the pack milligram if you're uh, non-black and another, uh, two milligrams if you're black. Right, so this is, I, I'm not promoting or endorsing this, but I'm saying this is considered normative and ethical within medical practice that you discriminate in the sense, in, in the positive sense, that you take notice of these racial groups uh, in order to try to equalize outcomes. Uh, this is the uh, algorithm for deciding on uh, first uh, stage monotherapy for hypertension from the British guidelines. Uh, you basically go down two paths, one if you're younger and non, or non-black um, or older or black, whether you get uh, ACE inhibition or beta blockers or going down the other pathway, whether your first line antihypertensive is calcium channel blockers or diuretics. So again, this is uh, standard practice in a number of different areas within medicine. Uh, it, it uh, yeah, you, within like uh, p um, policing, you, you might have a much stricter criteria about not using this kind of information, but it's actually promoted within medicine that this would be, um, that the, the, it would be unethical not to take advantage of this. Like I, I think the, uh, if you look at the platform or the, uh, the priorities of the NIH Institute, the National Institute for uh, Minority Health and Health Disparities, uh, their major emphasis is on this kind of embrace of diversity, which means you know, we're all different, we have all these different cultures, we have all these different races within American society, and we all have to be treated in a kind of precision medicine sense all differently to respect our wonderful diversity. And this is their very explicit kind of priority statement about what their institute is all about. So this is promoted as a, as a virtue within the field. Um, Dorothy mentioned uh, Sally Sattel writing in the New York Times uh, saying, you know, it would be unethical for me to ignore race. Um, and at the same time, of course, that, that this is promoted as a virtue, we have 
a great deal of medical evidence that race is used when physicians, uh, clinicians are aware of race, used in very pernicious ways to actually disadvantage people. So uh, there's, it's a two-edged sword in terms of being aware of this kind of uh, a classifier within the medical record um, that it's actually used in ways that are, are harmful to people, that are not benefiting people overall. So we, we have no shortage of evidence that this is in fact what happens in practice. Um, what we don't really have though in, in epidemiology and medicine, um, I mean the last speaker said you should look to epidemiology for the answer to these questions, but it's not really very well articulated exactly how this kind of um, evidence base is created within medicine and epidemiology. Uh, we don't really have a good definition of what it is to be fair or unfair, and we don't have a systematic way, as, as the previous speaker said, of taking into account measured or unmeasured variables that might explain part of the disparity that we observe. Uh, and a particularly pernicious problem that I'll discuss in greater detail is how we take into account uh, previous knowledge that we have that enters into our decisions. It's based on some uh, previously unfair situation and people using that information in a way that seems rational but perpetuates that, that inequality. And then how we use this information in order to actually eliminate inequalities, which is our goal. Um, so continuing with uh, the previous description, this is the sort of formal causal framework that people use within epidemiology and biostatistics. <laughs> We're talking about these things. Um, Moritz already put up the, the DAG. These are directed acyclic graphs as he described thinking about the protected class here as X, and you have two kinds of covariates. As he mentioned, you can have confounders like Z and mediators like W, and uh, you make uh, uh, statistical analyses based on your assumptions as encoded in this kind of a graph. Um, the only elaborations here is that this allows the covariate to also affect the, the, the mediator, the mediator's confounded here, or you could have unmeasured confounders, and you have to have identification under some unmeasured variables as well. This would be actually the typical situation that you have many things that are unmeasured. Um, so as you said, we have effects that can be direct or indirect, um, and the direct discrimination would be this, this arrow from X to Y, as, as he described. Um, so uh, this leads to the construction of a bunch of different um, uh, parameters that we might be interested in in order to detect uh, overt discrimination or in order to um, say how much of a disparity is mediated by some measured covariates. Um, so continuing in the same technical literature here, the total disparity is described as the distribution of Y in one class compared to the distribution of Y in the other classes, you know, the, the outcome prevalence in one group compared to the other groups. So what's, what's the disparity in breast cancer, prostate cancer between these two groups. Um, and then you could create some kind of a, a, of a counterfactual contrast. That's what Issa is going to talk about in greater detail, where you say, well, uh, what would my rate of prostate cancer be um, uh, in, uh, for a black man if I had the rate that white people enjoy? Right? Like, th this is a very reasonable thing to do to say, like, w what do we consider excess cases? You know, epidemiology is about epidemics. We have to know what are excess cases. How much prostate cancer is too much? Well, if blacks have a rate that's higher than whites, those are excess cases that they are suffering from because they have a rate that's higher than some reference group that we can describe. It could be the whole population, it could be an advantaged subgroup. So, this effect of the treatment among the treated, this using this econometric language. Uh, is just describing this kind of counterfactual quality of, or quantity, uh, which is uh, the rate that you would expect if you had, instead of the rate that's actually observed, the rate that would be observed in the advantage class. Um, and then you could do that conditional on covariates as well, right? So you could model this, you know, taking into account uh, confounders of these things, um, which makes sense. You know, we have a lot of historical confounding, you know, um, uh, African Americans are more likely to live in the South. Um, the southern part of the United States has lower life expectancy than the rest of the United States. So some of the life expectancy difference is confounded by state of residence, right? So it's not, uh, I mean, it's a historical kind of confounding. So you've taken that into account and you would estimate this excess accounting for some things like that. Uh, and then you have the construction of um, mediated quantities, which uh, again, the previous speaker started to get at. Um, you have the control direct effect, which is defined uh, as um, the, uh, the disparity that you would observe if you set the mediator a particular value. So uh, in his example, education, uh, how much of the gap between blacks and whites in some outcome is due to the fact that they have an educa educational disparity? Well, I can model that by saying, what if I forced everybody to get uh, an equivalent 
um, amount or quality of education, and I can model how much of the disparity is still existing after taking that into account. And then um, there's another formulation that's uh, due to Pearl and, and also Jamie Robbins uh, called this natural direct effect, which is a different quantity. Instead of setting the mediator to a specific value, you say, I, I want to know what the disparity would be if the mediator had the value that it would have had if you had been in the protected class. You know, I, I want to know what the black rate of prostate cancer would be if blacks had the same educational distribution that whites have. And that's called the natural direct effect. It has some advantages in interpretation having to do with effect measure modification, but um, uh, Pearl really likes this formulation, promotes this as the, the way that everybody should do mediation. Uh, many other people are critical about this because you can't verify it in a trial. There's no way you can make a randomized trial in which you assign people to the value they would have had if they were somebody else. Like, you can't, you can't actually practically do that. Um, and there are many people, Thomas Richardson and Jamie Robbins, who argue that these quantities don't actually exist, that they're complete mathematical abstractions. They have no meaning in the real world. Uh, Pearl has a completely different opinion, the arguments about whether they're actually identified, like whether you can actually estimate these things. So this is, this is an argument that goes on in the technical literature. Um, it's summarized uh, with, specifically with respect to race in this article by Vanderweel. Um, in which he sets this up with SES and proposes that you basically take a control direct effect approach to asking n not what would happen if you set race, right? We're not interested in changing anybody's race, as, as the previous speaker mentioned, but simply control direct effects for the mediator. Like, what would happen if we, if we gave, um, if, if we assigned people, you know, we have mechanisms for changing people's educational distribution. We have Pell Grants and other kind of policies that affect people's education distribution. So what would happen if we equalize their SES through some kinds of intervention? How much of the disparity would still exist? This seems to be a question that you could uh, ask. Um, uh, this uh, actually, it was um, uh, Nancy who made a nice uh, response to this, uh, pointing out that it's not actually consistent with our goals. Like what we really want to know is not what would happen if we set everybody's education level or SES to a certain level. That our social justice um, goal is really the elimination of the arrow uh, that connects race to social class. Like what do we actually want to achieve as a society is, is not that we want to go around setting people's social status by interventions, by policy interventions, but rather that we'd like to construct a society in which it's no longer the case that you're social status is determined by your race. And that means that um, what we're targeting, what we're actually interested in, uh, we should be interested in, is this natural direct effect. Is this um, effect if race had no effect on, your, on the distribution of your mediator? Um, that, that, that actually is, is a more logical thing to target. OK, so that, that's what goes on in, uh, in the technical literature. Uh, a couple of applied examples to show how this works in practice. So here's an example of mediation. Um, for gender. Um, Kolev just last month published a study of grants submitted to the Gates Foundation and the grant review was blinded. Okay, so we know a priori, as we're drawing out that DAG, we know that there cannot be an arrow from gender to uh, grant score because the evaluators are blinded. They don't know anything about the gender. Um, but there was this big gender disparity. So the title of the article is that blinding wasn't enough. Uh, and so they analyzed all the characteristics of the, of the grant applications to see what accounted for this. And it was um, uh, the use of broad versus narrow words, that men tended to use broad words and women tended to use narrow words, where broad and narrow are defined as how frequently those words occur in other grants. Like men use a word frequently in a grant that occurs in all the grants that are submitted, whereas women use words that are much more specific to their grant. And when they accounted for this, then there was no gender disparity. Um, in, interestingly, uh, that measure of broad versus uh, narrow words didn't predict at all the productivity of the people once they were funded. But did it, it did predict, presumably, then, the probability that something was funded. Like, yeah, yeah, that, that was the, the use of broad or narrow words was the, the variable that was correlated with gender, which predicted the funding, but not the productivity of the grant. OK, so that's an example of complete mediation, where you, you had a measured variable, and accounting for that, then there was no disparity any longer. That, that, that explained entirely the variation that was observed by gender. OK. Um, the other important element of this is the use of experiment, because I'm describing things in, in observational data. 
But we often use experiments in order to identify discrimi discrimination more directly. So here's an example of another recent paper by Adams looking at um, the, rate, the gender disparity in the price at auction of art. Um, and they analyzed 46 years of art auctions and 2 million transactions at art auctions. And they found that women artists got paid, uh, the, the value of the art was about 40% lower than whites. Uh, I'm sorry, 40% lower than men. Um, and again, they looked at a bunch of different covariates. The, the theme of the painting, this is painted by a woman. It has roses in it. Women were much more likely to paint roses. Uh, men were more likely to paint landscapes that didn't have roses. But when they counted for those things, it didn't, it didn't account for the gender disparity. So that, the, the, the uh, adjustment for measured variables did not contribute. Um, so they were kind of stuck in terms of the observed data. Um, so what they did is a bunch of experiments. So the first thing they did is to show a bunch of unknown paintings to people and ask them to estimate the gender of the artists and people got 50-50 for the gender. So they, they did no better than chance. So it was clear from the experiment that people could not tell from the painting the gender of the painter. And then they used computer programs to generate paintings and then they randomly assigned them to be listed as male or female and they got the 40% gap you know, where the ones assigned to be a female artist were valued less. So using the experiment, you can do a much better job of identifying the causal effect of the gender of the artist known to the uh, observer. But what you can't identify here, and this is the, the point that I wanted to make about the limitations of experiment here, is that, um, thank you, that um, there's a rational process here, and it, uh, the first speaker alluded to this as well, that uh, economists call statistical discrimination, which is that if people know, like wh what is the value of the artwork? It's what people are willing to pay. So if, if the, the person at the auction knows that women's art is valued 40% lower, then they're going to use that information to decide what they think people will pay for this painting. And then it has the value that they believe that it will have. Uh, there's no objective meaning to value. It's something assigned by your belief about willingness to pay. So this existence of this discrimination uh, uh, makes people who are not sexist themselves, like they're, they're behaving in a rational way, they're using their prior distribution in order to, um, to estimate the value of the paintings that includes that discrimination in their estimation. Um, by the way, it was also highly variable across time and across space, this gap. Um, the medical analog to that, um, there's a bunch of papers that use these kinds of audit experiments or these kinds of uh, um, you know, evaluations with fake patients in order to detect uh, direct discrimination. Uh, this paper by Shulman, for example, had videotapes of actors, black and white, male and female actors, reading a uh, uh, case presentation, like a, a complaint, a physical complaint, and they showed the videos to cardiologists and they were uh, asked to decide if the person should be referred for right heart catheterization, and there was a disparity where black women were referred less. Uh, but the interesting thing is they also asked the physicians to rate the make-believe patients on a bunch of other characteristics. And, you know, the black men, for example, were low socioeconomics, rated to have lower socioeconomic status, more likely to miss appointments, less likely to comply with treatment. Um, and so, again, you could say that this is clearly the causal effect of race, you know, in terms of a stimuli for the rater, like when you show the black actor instead of the white actor to the cardiologist, they attribute this lower socioeconomic status or this uh, less likely to comply with treatment, um, and that's, that's racism, right? You're detecting that through this experiment. But the other possibility is that they have a prior distribution based on their experience or their beliefs that there's this difference in socioeconomic status or in compliance based on race and gender, and they're applying that. And the two problems there, one is that their, their calibration might not be accurate. Like they may have a stereotype about blacks and socioeconomic status or compliance, that may actually be way off. So that's one problem. Another problem is that that's based on the average person in the distribution. It's not based on the person sitting in front of them, right? So you could have, uh, you know, not everybody sitting at the mean, and you could very strongly mischaracterize a person by applying the mean value for the population to them if, if you think that that's the only thing you know about them. All right, so my last applied example, because I'm running out of time here, is the one that Dorothy mentioned on Wednesday as an example of this kind of a problem of statistical discrimination. Uh, it's not direct discrimination. It's not racism in the direct sense that you have racist doctors, but it's a racist algorithm in the way that it discriminates people by, by using a mean to describe everybody in the population. So this is the problem of glomerular... I've been teaching this for 30 years, and I still can't say the word glomerular. 
um, uh, GFR, Gamelier Filtration Rate, um, which is something that you can't really, in, for practical reasons, you can't measure directly, right? It, to, to measure it directly in a study, you have to like feed somebody some material and then collect all their pee for 24 hours and carefully measure the rate at which they're peeing it out. So it's not feasible in a hospital situation. So what we do is we estimate it, right? You take some measured parameters and you have a function that's been developed to estimate this. So um, the first one was this uh, Cockcroft-Galt equation and then the MDRD equation, uh, CKD-EPI, and, and then Cystatin-C. Um, the one that uh, is most highly recommended now is the CKD-EPI, is the sort of modern one that everybody's supposed to use. Um, the cockrock golf equation is a little bit outdated now. It does not involve race. It's age, sex, body weight, and serum creatinine. Um, these first three are all based on serum creatinine. Um, and it was developed in about 250 white men. And to apply it to women, they just assumed that women would be penalized 15%. And then it would apply to women as well. Um, so it's just this uh, equation. And they observed that the prediction was worse for African Americans. So this led them, the community, to decide we need a uh, a better equation that takes race into account because we have this worse prediction for African Americans. So they developed this MDRD equation, and now you include race, which is just African Americans versus everybody else in the world. Um, and this is based on 1,600 Americans, uh, and it's an equation here that just has this black penalty here. You get an extra 20% here if you're black, uh, raising your, your GFR. Uh, and then this was improved a little bit using the same variables Test, uh, developed on a larger data set here that involved a little bit more diverse uh, populations. Um, this is the, the dominant one now that's most highly recommended. Um, and it also uses the same things in the equation, but the parameters are a little bit different here in the equation. So now your penalty for black is that you get, incre your GFR gets increased by about, you know, 16%. Uh, so it's like tweaking on that. Um, but th this is the standard of care now. Uh, there's this other alternative, which is um, cystatin C, uh, which does not involve race because it does not involve creatinine. And so there's no, um, so, oh yeah, so I should say, Dorothy mentioned this too. The explanation for why you need this for race is, um, has to do with the relation between creatinine and muscle mass and the assertion that because blacks have more muscle mass, this is why you need to uh, um, adjust for this. So cystatin C does not rely on, muscle, uh, on creatinine, and so there's no relationship, and it's found that you don't need to take into account race when you use this measure, but it's not widely used in practice. And the explanation that I found was that it is affected by things like smoking. And they said, well, it's really hard to know if someone's really a smoker and how much they smoke. That's too complicated. Race is very simple. You just look at them and you know what race they are. But smoking is a complicated thing. You wouldn't really know that. Um, so I, I don't exactly know. Maybe it's a more expensive. I'm not sure. It, it is recommended as a kind of, um, like if you have some uh, clinical uncertainty, you're supposed to order this test. But it's not widely used. Uh, and it could be. And then we wouldn't have a, a race-specific one. Um, other countries have said. Is it as good? Is it as accurate? Yeah. It's, uh, yes. So why couldn't you just use the first score, but some correction that is just based on muscle mass yeah. directly? Uh, it's, it, it, clinically, it's not easy to measure muscle mass either. Uh, like, it's, it's not something, you can do it in studies, but again, it's not, at the bedside, it's not an easy thing to estimate. You, I'm, I'm sure you have better, I'll, I'll talk about this in a second, I'm sure you have better proxies for muscle mass than race, uh, but we don't have a direct measure. <laughs> Like a very rough estimate would probably be reasonably good. Yeah, when you look at somebody, you get yeah. a rough estimate that's probably much better than you get from race. Yeah, yeah this is exactly what I'll talk about. So other countries, by the way, have rejected this, and they said, like, in our populations, we don't need to apply this. Uh, this is the French document saying, it actually says, um, you should not apply this black correction to black people in France, but we don't know what you should do with them. This is from 2011, so I don't know what's happened since then, but they're just like warning people, like, don't do, you know, if you see a black person in France, don't apply this thing, because it doesn't work for them. Um, and likewise, I found similar things. This is from Brazil, and they said, look, we did a validation study, and this race correction doesn't do anything in Brazil, so don't use this. And I found another one in England that says the same thing. So I can't find any other place outside the United States or, or Canada where, um, like people have embraced this race term, and it specifically says African Americans. It doesn't say black people, it's African Americans only that get this correction. And then it's compared to everybody else in the world, yeah. Um, so uh, Nancy just showed me this. This came out in JAMA yesterday, June 6th in JAMA. Uh, here you see against measured GFR here, here's the black penalty. Uh, you know, the number of GFR units that you 
you get increased if you're black. This is the cut point for being eligible for kidney transplant. Um, and so there's no doubt that people are disadvantaged by having their score raised um, across some cut point like this. Like if you're just at the cut point, you get your score raised, you're gonna be disadvantaged in terms of where you get on the wait list. What is the practical implication of that? This is from another paper in 2016. This is the time you spend on the wait list waiting for a kidney if you're black versus if you're white. This is twice as high if you're black than if you're white. I don't know, I have, I mean, I just put this together for this talk. I haven't looked to see, like if you could do an analysis, what proportion of the variation in wait time is accounted for the GFR difference. I, I'm sure you could estimate that, but uh, it, it clearly matters. It clearly makes a difference if you're near the cut point. <coughs> so this question that you just raised, like this is used as a proxy. I was interested, like how good of a proxy is this? How much of the variation in, uh, in muscle mass is accounted for by race? I couldn't find that anywhere in the literature. I went to N. Haynes and did the analysis because there you have the dual x-ray absorbiometry for muscle mass, so you can see. And this is the distribution of whites and blacks. It is true, uh, in the N. Haynes data anyway, that the black mean is significantly higher than the white mean. But it's also true that if you know that a person is black or white, you have almost no additional information about what their individual muscle mass is. Right? And so to treat people categorically, to say, you know, like uh, Spike Lee walks into your clinic and Arnold Schwarzenegger walks into your clinic and you say, oh, Spike Lee, you have more muscle mass. Like, it's just absolutely ridiculous. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. And yet this is exactly what normative medical practice is saying about these variables. Like, you, you have to do this. So to give a kind of absurd example of this, um, I'm about to take the red eye tonight, so I'd really like to be in one of these exit seats because then you can put your legs out and really spread out. How does the airline assign these exit seats in a fair way? No, they sell them, right? So you have to actually, it's discrimination for rich people, right? But what would a fair algorithm be? Well, a fair algorithm would be if you're tall, you should get the exit seat because you have more leg, like you, you need that space. Like a fair society would assign the exit row to taller people. But the airline doesn't know how tall you are. When you buy your ticket, they know how rich you are, right? But they don't know how tall you are. Um, so they could have an algorithm, because when you check in to get your airline ticket, you have to check your, your birth date and your gender, right? So they know whether you're a man or a woman, and they can have a rule that says men always get the exit row. And why do men always get the exit row? Because men on average are taller than women, just about like this, <laughs> right? And so they would be rational in the sense that because there's a significant difference in the mean here, you are making a rational judgment by always giving the exit row to men. But it means when, this, when these two people show up to get on the airline, you're gonna to say to the woman, no, you're not allowed to sit there because you're shorter. And the woman can say, well, I'm obviously not shorter. And you say, well, but you belong to a group which is shorter on average, and therefore I'm gonna treat you like you're at the, cent at the mean of your distribution. And that is discriminatory for that individual because people are not all at the mean of their distribution. And that's a kind of unfairness as well, to be treated at the mean from a distribution. There's a big statistical literature or, or econometric, econometric literature about the statistical discrimination, which also talks about the, the varying width of that distribution for blacks and for whites and how more blacks are farther from their mean because of clinical uncertainty and things like that. And so this, this aspect becomes important. Okay, so that's... Uh, that's what I wanted to say, I think I'm over time. Um, it should be considered uh, unethical to use a weak proxy like this. Like, it, well, I say it, it should not be considered ethical to use a weak proxy like this. Like this idea, like I'm gonna categorically treat blacks and whites different in this way because of the difference in the average. I'm sure, I didn't do it yet, but I'm sure I can go in N. Haynes and come up with 20 variables that are available at the bedside that are better predictors of muscle mass I mean, not to mention you can just look at somebody and have a better idea than you could get by taking into account their race. And so it's absolutely absurd. Um, this framework that we use in causal inference for direct and indirect effects um, has some advantages and has this experimental foundation that you could do experiments in order to test for this direct discrimination, but it doesn't do very well for this kind of statistical discrimination that's involved in like, what you know previously about people and what assumptions you make about distributions that people come from. Okay, thank you.